Welcome to Remote Decision Support with CDS Hooks. I'm your host, Melinda Stewart from HL7. Our speaker is Dennis Patterson from Cerner. Our moderator on Whova is Brian Keeney, and I'll now turn it over to Dennis. All right, thanks a lot, Melinda. Um, so welcome to Remote Decision Support with CDS Hooks. Uh, my name is Dennis Patterson. I'm an Associate Principal Engineer I'm at Cerner. I have platform and architectural responsibilities over a variety of our open platform solutions, including building out our CDS Hooks client platform. Um, I'm also, also a committer to the CDS Hooks specification um, and the public sandbox. So you all are, are, many of you should be very familiar with the idea of smart apps. They're a very powerful framework for um, interoperability with um, applications. Uh, but there is a challenge that's inherent with the idea of a smart app. So we'll take an example to kind of illustrate this. So take a Billy Rubin chart. Um, this was an app that was created by Intermountain Healthcare. Um, and as you might guess, it's applicable to a newborn patients who are less than 120 hours old. Um, and especially when their Billy Rubin results are either not documented or outside of the accepted range. Uh, and it's when these criteria hold true uh, that this chart app is useful to a clinician. However, that user needs to know that the app is available in their healthcare institution. So they need to know um, that their institution has purchased it and made it available in their system. They need to know that that app is relevant or the criteria for which that app is relevant. And while that might seem fairly straightforward for a Billy Rubin chart app, you can extrapolate that problem to a, a whole host, a whole variety of different applications to where the user has to mentally compute um, all of these different sets of criteria when certain apps might be useful. And then thirdly, the user has to be able to find that app in order to launch it. So they need to know where is it in their EHR, you know, which, which menu items do they need to click on, how do they go to navigate to find it if it is available. So though, you know, that, general problem statement um, was the initial idea that pushed CDS hooks. And it has since been um, broadened to meet uh, a variety of other kinds of decision support that we'll get into. So simply put, CDS hooks is a vendor agnostic remote decision support specification. So it, it defines an API a specification for decision support, um, but specifically remote decision support. And it is vendor agnostic, meaning it's intended to be an open platform uh, like many of the other HL7 um, specifications that you're familiar with. So CDS Hooks did originate behind the team, uh, behind Smart. It's open source and it is an HL7 standard. And one of the first things you might be asking yourself though is, wait, doesn't Fire already define an approach to CDS? And you would be correct. Um, there are clinical reasoning resources um, that are very useful for modeling clinical decision support, um, including modeling um, some of the rules for decision support. So you might have something like CQL um, that, that models those algorithms or you know, when decision support should happen. Uh, the good news is, is that there is harmony uh, between these two approaches. They're governed by the same body, the HL7 Clinical Decision Support Working Group. Um, clinical reasoning um, as an approach focuses more on local decision support. So you're going to have these resources within the local fire server, whereas CDS hooks is less about what the particular algorithm is and you know, how it's modeled and more around how you would invoke a remote service for decision support. Now that being said, that remote service could still use the clinical reasoning resources in modeling its decision support. So you know, there is opportunity for some overlapping here, uh, but the good news is that these two approaches work well together. So one of the main actors within the CDS hook specification is that idea of a remote CDS service. So this is a service that's invoked by the CDS client via a hook. So CDS client is often that, that EHR, it's whatever it is that's aware of, of the, the context of a particular workflow. And within the specification, the hook is the event. So, so far we have um, a service is told when a particular event happens um, by the CDS client or EHR that understands that event. That CDS service then evaluates its own logic uh, using fire data. So it has fire data at its disposal uh, but ultimately, it's going to evaluate its own logic. 
and the specification is silent as to what that logic is. It's more focused on the API through which a remote service would be informed that, that event occurred. And thirdly, it returns decision support via what the spec calls cards. And we'll get into all of these things more in detail. But when I say that it evaluates its own logic, um, I really mean it. So the, the logic could be very procedural. It could be a series of if else statements. Um, it could be more fancy, it could use artificial intelligence or have a neural network, or it could use a mechanical Turk or a Ouija board. Um, the specification really is, is silent about this. It's not intended to dictate anything about what that logic is, simply to define what the API is through which a remote service could be informed uh, about actions in a workflow. So let's start by looking at some of the example hooks. So these are three of the more mature hooks in the ecosystem. CDS hooks as a specification doesn't actually define um, hooks themselves. They're defined um, external to the CDS hooks core framework, but the framework does define how a, a hook is defined. And so these three more mature ones, uh, first we have patient view. So this is simply when a patient's chart is opened by a user. The second two are ordering based hooks. And you can imagine th through the treatment of a patient, um, there's a couple of different sub events um, in the process of ordering. So you can imagine a user who is selecting or prescribing particular orderables. The first thing they're gonna do is select those orderables. Um, that they may continue to, to, to tweak different details or aspects about those orders. Uh, and then when they're done, um, you can imagine like a shopping cart, or they're gonna go to checkout, they're gonna go to sign those orders. So order select as a hook, um, correlates to those actions of you know, selecting the orders that are going to be placed. And when they're finalized, the order, align, order sign aligns with the actual sign action. So let's look at this um, using a diagram, kind of help you see the overall workflow. So the user is treating a patient and they want to place a particular prescription. Um, when they select this, it triggers um, a CDS hook. Uh, in this case, it would be the order select hook. And there may be one or more services that are listening for that particular event. So they're informed that this particular med um, was selected. Then they can execute their own rules. Uh, they leverage fire data as needed and ultimately return decision support in the form of cards, which are rendered by the CDS client. So these cards can take uh, a variety of different forms. They can have a variety of different types of guidance in them. Uh, that may be informational, so textual information. Um, it may take the form of suggestions. So this is a bit more actionable um, where the user could then click a button to change out something that was ordered, for example. Or going back to that initial use case, they can push a smart app. They can recognize that you know, the particular um, Workflow matches up to a use case for an app. So here's a link to a smart app that could be helpful to you in the course of treating that patient. Let's start getting into the weeds a bit, look more at the API that's involved behind the scenes. So here you can see uh, that the JSON request that's, that's sent to the CDS service, um, as well as the fact that it's an HTTP post um, that's sent to that service. And these are some of the, the the core fields. It's not exhaustive, but it gives you an idea of what some of the fields are um, that are sent to a CDS service. So first we have the hook that's informing them which specific hook was invoked, a hook instance field that uniquely identifies this particular instance of that hook, a URL to the fire server if they want to call that to get more information, and then some context information that's going to be unique to each particular hook to define um, the relevant data points for that event. So in this case, um, the user who opened the chart and, and the patient whose chart was opened. So once the CDS service has that information, it's gonna execute its service logic and again, ultimately return cards. So it'll return a 200 status and uh, an array of cards. Now as to those cards themselves, a CDS service can return any number of cards. So they can return multiple cards if they have multiple pieces um, of, of guidance that they want to be shown that, that seem to logically be, be represented as separate cards, separate alerts. Um, or if they don't have any guidance for that event, they can return no cards. And then the CDS client renders each card as it sees fit. So it is a JSON response from the CDS service. 
So where in the, the smart world, a smart app developer is going to be very keen to ensure that the look and feel of their application um, is properly tuned, uh, that it matches within uh, an EHR that it might be rendered in. Uh, with CDS looks, they're returning JSON. And so the CDS client is going to render each card um, a lot, right alongside its own native decision support um, in a way that would hopefully make them seem seamless. Um, you wouldn't even be able to tell the difference necessarily. Uh, and each card that comes back um, has to have at least these three attributes in it. So a summary of what the clinical guidance is, an indicator denoting what the importance of that guidance is, and information on the organization or, or the data sets that's the source of the card's data. So really, it's what's the guidance, how important is it, and says who or on, on what authority is this guidance being shown to me. So that, those are the, the pieces that have to be there for every card. And then here's just an example in JSON of how that might look. Now, of course, there's other pieces of guidance. And you saw previously some of the examples of types of guidance. So you can imagine there would be other fields to represent that as well. But we'll go through um, a couple of these fields. So uh, for the card indicator, there are three um, possible values that are defined by the specification. There's informational or warning or critical. And really, this is meant to give the CDS client more information around the nature of the guidance to help influence how that guidance is being shown to the user. Um, and so it may influence some styling of the card data. Um, it, it could be something like color coding, uh, but you could also imagine that while a critical card might be shown as a modal pop-up, you'd want that to be something that would interrupt the user's workflow in the treatment of that patient. Uh, but something that's more on the informational side of things um, could be shown in a more passive manner. Uh, but this gives the CDS client uh, the information it needs to help make that decision or help influence um, configuration around that sort of thing. Let's look at some card examples here. So you already saw um, a few of these, but it shows a little bit more tangible examples around the types of cards. So you could have an informational only card that just has text information for the provider, such as, you know, I see that the, the, the patient is on particular medications, but they also have this genotype, and so they might have a reduced response. You could also include GitHub flavored markdown in this text to um, allow for a bit of styling. Cards can also have suggestions. So this is actions brought back into the CDS client in the form of fire resources. So you could have new orders represented in fire or modifications to the orders that were sent outbound as part of an order select. So um, if you selected that earlier medication that you saw, it could be sent out as a medication request. And then a suggestion might come back in to change something about that medication request or change to a different medication request altogether. And again, the user could click that button and you would want to see that changed out um, before they go to hit sign. And then lastly, that original use case, the app link. Um, so you'd have a link there to open up a, a smart app in a new window um, to provide more of a rich experience for the user or to get additional information. And while we separate these out as different types of cards. There is no card type field in the API. These are just more like colloquial um, categories that we put the cards into to generally refer to them. And you're not even limited to these individual types of, of guidance. You can mix and match and combine them so you could have information, suggestions, and links and all in the same card. So this is fine. This is great. Uh, we've covered how when a particular event happens, how a CDS client or EHR is able to communicate to a remote service to tell them about that event. And we've looked at some of the fields that can come back in the reply uh, with that clinical guidance. But how does a CDS client um, know where these services are? Well, there's a discovery mechanism built into the spec. So each ser CDS service provider is going to host its CDS services at some base URL. And if you append a path segment to that path, that's CDS hyphen services, you get a discovery endpoint. And that discovery endpoint is going to list out all of the services that are available at that base path, um, as well as help identify um, where they all live underneath that base path. So for example, if you were to issue an HTTP get to example.com slash CDS services, 
you would get back a card or a service array of all the different services of that endpoint uh, with attributes such as what hook is this particular service interested in? What's the title and description for that service? What's the ID or the unique identifier for that service? Uh, and optionally, some prefetch requirements, which we'll get into later. So that ID is really helpful because as you can see, um, if you were to take the, the whole base URL plus the CDS services path segment and then add the ID, that's where a CDS client would go to invoke that particular service to tell them that, you know, in this case, that a patient view event occurred. So when a CDS client does call that service, what kind of data is available to that service for it to perform its decision support? Well, they may have their own proprietary data sources. So pieces of, of data that are unique to them make them a, a valuable service. But they also have uh, a few other kinds of data at their disposal. The first is hook context data. So I already mentioned earlier that there's some unique data um, for each individual hook. Uh, and that's data that's gonna go along to them for that, that post event we looked at earlier when you're telling the CDS service about the event. There's hook context data that comes with that call uh, to inform them about the event. Next, there might be other pieces of data other than the data that uniquely defines that event that's needed by the CDS service in order for it to perform its decision support. So other information about the patient, um, about, their, about their chart, so they might have conditions or meds or whatever it is that the CDS service needs to perform its decision support that could be pushed to the service as part of invoking that service. Um, but lastly, um, there's also the option for a CDS service to reach back into the HR or call back to the CDS client's fire server to obtain additional information in more of a pull fashion. So for the hook context data, um, each hook defines its own workflow and context. It's just part of its definition. And the hook context data is gonna be data just specific to the hook to help communicate that that, that event occurred. And it's data that all CDS services using that hook would use. So for example, for something like patient view, you'll note in the table below, while it has user information, patient information, and encounter information, it doesn't have the whole patient resource, for example, because not every CDS service is necessarily gonna need the full patient demographics or full resource, uh, but they will need the patient ID. And if they do need the full demographics, they can either define that in their prefetch criteria and ask for that to be sent along with the call, or they can, again, call back to the fire server to get that. Um, so it's constrained, the hook context is constrained to the data that, that all services are gonna need. And it can be fire data or references to fire data, uh, but it doesn't mandate that it has to be fire data. So here, um, looking again at these fields that are in patient view, user ID is going to be the resource plus the ID because you can have different types of users in clinical systems you're gonna have the patient ID and then optionally the encounter ID. So, and then if you were to go and look at the definition for order select or order sign, you would similarly, you would see some differences there because you'd want to bring in um, the definitions of those orders and have that be part of what's sent to a CDS service to tell them that orders were being selected. As for the prefetch data, um, this is always going to be fire data uh, that's fetched for the CDS service are fetched on their behalf and sent along with the hook invocation. It's data that's specific to a given CDS service. So that is, the CDS client doesn't necessarily send the same prefetch data to all CDS services. If you recall back on a former slide, when you looked at the discovery endpoint, you remember that each CDS service defines the prefetch data that it wants. So those prefetch definitions or requirements could vary across a variety of different CDS services. Uh, and so the CDS client will just make sure that it sends each CDS service only what it asks for, or what it's interested in. However, CDS clients are not required by the spec to honor prefetch requests from CDS services. There are a number of reasons why they, they would choose to do so and why it can be optimal for them to do so. Um, but CDS services also need to be prepared that if they don't get the data that they need um, to reach back into the HR or reach back to a fire server and, and pull that data. 
the prefetch data requirements in that discovery endpoint are expressed as fire read or search queries. So just for a couple examples here, you could have the patient demographics, the, the full patient resource that I mentioned earlier would be expressed as patient slash and then context.patient ID. And that's referring to the hook context. So for a, a patient view or even for an order select or order sign event, um, if the context has a field called patient view, this is saying, give me that patient with the ID that was indicated by that hook context. But you could also have the capability statement prefetched, or you can imagine any number of other prefetch requests uh, that might be defined. Uh, but the question remains, why might a CDS service ask for prefetch data, or why might a CDS client honor that prefetch data? And you got a hint at, at some of those reasons, uh, but I want to get into three of them. First, there's perhaps data that your CDS service just always needs. So there may be something initially when a CDS service gets told about an event, something that it always needs to check for. There may be other pieces of data further on down at its logic that it only needs in particular scenarios. Um, but if there's something that it always needs, that would be a great thing to define as fire prefetch request data. Next, uh, efficiency is another reason um, that a, a CDS service might ask for this data. So if you, you can imagine that there can be a variety of different CDS services that are all at the same time listening for the same event. And if multiple CDS services want the same piece of data, it would be more optimal for that CDS client to fetch the data for them once and push it out to multiple services rather than each of those services have to duplicate that request back into the HR um, to ask for that data. And then lastly, performance, which is closely related to efficiency. As the CDS client is it, you know, usually able to retrieve the data in a more performant manner. They're usually closer to the data. They could have the data in memory or you know, in cache, um, or again, because of the the nearness to the data, there might be less latency in order to retrieve it. And so that could be another reason why it would be optimal if you're going to provide timely decision support that's useful at the time of care um, to prefetch data and push it out to CDS services. So let's recap some of these areas of concern uh, along with their owners. So we have the CDS client is responsible for understanding the user's workflow, the events or triggers or hooks um, that are occurring and gathering the, that context data uh, to be sent to a CDS service provider. Once the CDS service provider has that data and knows about that event, they are responsible for the decision support, for executing their logic, using this data to provide recommendations and guidance back to the user, um, as well as getting any additional data that they might need. And then once they've returned that back to the CDS client, the CDS client is responsible for presenting that back to the user to make sure that the user has it accessible as they treat patients. Now in understanding all of this, this API, uh, I wanna call your attention to a, a cheat sheet that we have out on cdstooks.org. Um, so if you navigate to this website and go on the left-hand side, there's a navigation sidebar and there should be a link to a, a cheat sheet. So it's not an exhaustive representation of the specification, uh, but it's really nice and handy uh, as a summary um, when you're sitting there and you're trying to understand the spec, maybe trying to code a CDS client or CDS service um, and to just have a, a one-stop shop to see what the APIs look like and a summary of what each field means. Now, beyond um, the general API for how a CDS client communicates with a CDS service, um, we've looked at the different fields that are, that are sent back and forth to express the events and express the guidance. Um, but there's one thing that we haven't looked yet, and, and that is the security around this. So there's three areas that I'll touch on. The first is how does a CDS client trust the CDS service that they're, that they're calling? And they do this via the fact that the CDS service has to be exposed at a TLS protected endpoint. So the CDS client will perform you know, all of the standard uh, certificate validation measures that exist today with implementing and validating, you know, calling a TLS endpoint. But how does the CDS service trust and know its caller? How does it trust particular CDS clients? And it does so because the CDS client is going to send a signed JOT or JSON web token, uh, which we'll look at in a minute. Uh, and then lastly, 
a CDS client provides a fire access token to CDS services. So early on, when we were talking through the types of data that are available to a CDS service, I mentioned there's prefetch data that could be sent and pushed to the service, uh, but there's also the option for the service to turn around and, and call a fire endpoint to retrieve data. Now, the service doesn't have any kind of UI. There's no opportunity to um, allow a user to log in, nor would that be appropriate or uh, performant if they were to interrupt the provider's workflow for the user to quickly log in. Um, and so the CDS client um, has the opportunity to push out a fire access token that is constrained to the particular user and what the user has access to, um, as well as constrained to each individual CDS service. Because you know, if you're familiar with um, the smart framework, you're familiar with the idea of, of scopes that are granted to, to smart apps. So in a similar manner, CAS services are going to have um, scopes uh, aligned to them. And so the fire access tokens are only gonna grant access to resources that that service has been um, validated and given the authority uh, to call. But let's, let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into that, that jot that gets sent to the CDS services to authenticate clients to services. So if you, if you haven't seen a jot before, it looks a little bit like this. Uh, it's a, a, an encoded field. Um, you can go out to jwt.io and paste this in and it'll, it'll break down each of the, the components. Um, the first component there, which I've color coded these, so you can kind of see the three different parts that exist. The first part is the header that gives, an informa gives some information around um, how this particular jot has been signed for, so that you can verify it. The middle part um, is the part you're most interested in, which is the payload, which you can see um, decoded here to see some of what's represented within the jot. And then the third component um, is the signature so that a, a CDS service can verify that this jot um, is signed um, and can be trusted. Now, as for the individual fields uh, within the payload, um, there is an issuer field. This is gonna be a URL that identifies a particular CDS client. There's an audience field that's gonna identify the CDS service that's being called. There's a, an optional tenant field that could identify the healthcare organization um, that's invoking this service request. So um, you can think of a use case where a CDS service is being called by, we'll say Cerner, and um, Cerner's CDS hooks framework, uh, but the tenant would then communicate well, which, which Cerner client, which Cerner healthcare institution um, is the one at which this particular event is firing. Um, and that would be communicated in this jot. As well as there's an issue that time and an expiry time to give a, you know, a, a timeline in, in which this jot is valid. And then lastly, a, a nonce value. These, these tokens are designed for one-time use. Now we also, uh, as part of the ecosystem for CDS hooks and to, to help facilitate um, CDS service development, we have a robust sandbox at sandbox.cdshooks.org. This is a JavaScript application that runs entirely in the browser, meaning that there's no, no data that's gonna be sent to any servers. Um, so you can load this up in your browser. Uh, you can configure it to call any other fire servers. So it has default fire server that it's configured for as well as some default CDS services, but it can call anything that's accessible by your browser. So if you want to run a fire server and some CDS services on localhost, um, you can wire that up and try this out as a CDS client stand-in. Now it supports two hooks today. Uh, the patient view hook, which you can see that patient view tab at the front um, that would invoke the patient view hook. So here we have Daniel Adams's chart is opened um, and some cards, some default cards um, that are, are rendered there. The RX view tab allows you to test out order select, though today it's limited to, to medication orders, but it does allow you to try out uh, that hook as well. And then and while the left-hand side shows more of a mock EHR, um, the right-hand side is a helpful developer panel that you can, you can expand or, um, or you can push off to the side if you don't want to see it. But it's useful to go in there and select from the dropdown your CDS service and see what the browser thinks it is sending to your service and what the browser sees as being returned from your service. So you can compare that with what's being rendered and help you in, in troubleshooting and developing your CDS services. Now, over the years um, in the development of CDS hooks, um, it, which is a, it's a long time in the making. 
And there's been a variety of different CDS clients that have implemented the specification um, and given feedback, as well as a whole host of CDS services that have done the same. And this, this slide is not even exhaustive. Um, there, I'm sure there's several uh, that are not represented here, but hopefully what it informs you and, and helps communicate is that there've been a lot of eyes uh, looking through the specification, uh, building it out, maturing it, and ensuring that it's, it's ready for you know, real-time production clinical decision support. Um, also to show some of the, the TLC that's been given to the specification um, is within the span of the Argonaut project. So if you're not familiar with the Argonaut project, um, kind of a, a, a summary um, just about it. Um, it's a US program to help facilitate and accelerate adoption of open standards uh, and help interested parties work through issues um, and again, facilitate adoption um, and ensure consistency across implementations as well. And a few events that I'll highlight here is uh, you know, a few years ago, um, as when Argonaut first started um, focusing on the use case to push smart apps and start maturing CDS hooks as a specification. That year, they also funded an external security assessment and threat model um, using the same security company that was used to assess and threat model smart. And then last year, they focused on uh, a use case for pushing appropriate radiology ordering via a CDS service. Um, so in the US, this was something called uh, PAMA, and it, it pertains to uh, measuring the appropriateness of radiology orders and whether or not they will be reimbursed by Medicare. Um, so in this, uh, in this workflow, something we, we worked through is you would call a CDS service um, to express a particular radiology order that was being ordered and the condition or the, the why it's being ordered. And there's a set of appropriate use criteria that would evaluate that and return back a rating that could get stamped on um, the order um, or potentially um, prompt launching a smart app to provide more additional information, which would then be communicated back to uh, the CDS client to stamp such a rating. Uh, to get into some more history, uh, we did publish the 1.0 specification uh, a bit over a year ago, last April. Uh, and since then, we've also been balloting and maturing hooks. So patient view has been balloted. We're still working through um, the final ballot comments and we hope to finish that up soon. Uh, and then we would move on to ordering uh, based hooks and, and bring them through the same process so we can get order select and order sign uh, published as well. Uh, but the next logical question is, you know, for the broader CVS hooks framework itself, what's after 1.0? Well, there's a number of different things that we've talked through. Um, we're, we're still, you know, early in the process of, of, of starting that, but we do intend to ballot a 1.1. Um, but whether 1.1 or beyond, I'll give you an idea of some of the things that we've been thinking through. So one is the notion of system only actions. I mentioned this first because this was something that came up in that the PAMA Argonaut project, um, which is most of the time when a CDS service returns guidance, um, that's gonna be shown to the user for user interaction. But there's a, a, maybe a smaller subset of use cases where it might be appropriate for a CDS service to return some guidance that doesn't necessarily um, interrupt a user. So for example, specifically with the PAMA scenarios, a user might be placing um, a radiology order. And if the remote CDS service deems that that order is appropriate and returns that rating, um, that might get stamped on the order while they're, they're placing it. And you might see a little green checkbox, but you don't necessarily need to interrupt the provider to tell them that they're doing a good job and that everything is just fine. So just imagine scenarios like that, where um, you might apply a score or something else where it's not necessary and also clinically safe to not interrupt a, a clinician. Second is enhanced suggestion handling. So today, uh, when a card comes back in the 1.0 spec, suggestions within there, um, which is the fire representations of actions, um, they're presented as mutually exclusive options. And so some of, of what is being proposed is allowing, uh, rather than mutually exclusive suggestions, um, breaking apart the guidance into allowing the user to kind of more piecemeal um, which parts of it they want to accept. So you might have two suggestions where it's clinically safe to accept both of them, uh, but it gives them more of the opportunity to opt in to what they want and kind of help compose that a bit more. Um, as well as um, to indicate that one or more suggestions um, is recommended uh, above another one. And then thirdly, um, this one got a, a lot of attention at our recent Connectathon, and that's of capturing decisions. Um, so today in the 1.0 spec, 
when a card is rendered to a user and the user interacts with that card, the CDS service doesn't have any context around those interactions. So part of, uh, of what's being proposed, and this is a, a snapshot from the public sandbox, um, where you have a card and you could decide to change to a generic med because it's cheaper um, or dismiss the card and return some override reasons. So part of what's being proposed is allowing a CDS service to return some reasons why a user might not accept that particular guidance um, and return back some of those override reasons. Um, but when the user interacts with that card, whether they accept that suggestion or dismiss it, um, since the CDS service doesn't have any awareness of that, uh, it would be nice if they did have awareness of that so that they could track that in, in metrics. Um, they could take that back and improve their algorithms, um, ultimately for the, the better experience of the user and the better treatment of that patient. If they can make tweaks and dig into maybe why a user frequently dismisses their card or, or even you know, enforce that this particular suggestion is, is used the vast majority of the time. So I'm, now I'm gonna go in and indicate that that suggestion is recommended above the others. And you could even provide a statistic to the user that such and such percentage you know, in, in this particular healthcare institution accepted or anything, something like that. Uh, but it at least um, completes that loop a bit of informing the CDS service how their guidance is being used uh, for the better improvement of the system as a whole. So that's kind of what's, what's uh, up next for CDS Hooks. Uh, I've got some references here. CDSHooks.org is gonna host the latest and greatest of the specification. That's kind of the, the snapshot uh, build Whereas anything that's published is going to live out on HL7's website, whether that be on the specification itself or published hooks, you'll find that out on cdshooks.hl7.org. Um, again, here is the URL for our public sandbox where you can load up uh, a mock CDS client and start experimenting with CDS services. Uh, and because all of this is open source, it can all be found on GitHub. And this particular site, CDS, uh, github.com slash CDS hooks um, has the source behind that CDS hooks.org site, the latest and greatest site. So you can go out there, you can log issues for things that you'd like to see in the spec or just help chime in um, to influence the future of the spec. I, I absolutely encourage you to get involved um, and, and to help bring your expertise to that conversation so we can make sure that it's a usable um, specification for clinical decision support. And lastly, I will point you to um, a tutorial um, that's available. So if you do want to get your hands uh, dirty a bit with the spec uh, and try it out, you can go to, to this site on GitHub. It allows you to stand up some CDS services just that come working out of the box on your local system. You can call them from um, sandbox.cdshooks.org and see that guidance. And then there's uh, some exercises um, that are out there in the tutorial as well to customize the guidance from those services um, and further you know, enhance your understanding of how the specification works. Um, all my slides are open source as well. Um, they're out on public GitHub. Uh, I'll leave this here just for a second, um, but this is really my last slide. So, so we transition here to questions. Hey Dennis, can you yeah, hear me? I can. You got some questions lined Great. up for yeah, me? A couple, couple questions. Um, Great. One, one looks about um, more about the architecture. Okay. Um, it, it asks, uh, uh, someone asked about, um, do you see CDS hooks adding value versus the EHR itself generating the cards based on the data it holds? So um, is there value in having uh, remote decision support at all? Sounds I like think the that's, question. that's probably what it could be getting at. Yeah, sure. Um, well, you know, what, what my mind immediately goes to is that, you know, why not have um, EHRs just create their own apps um, and kind of have a closed system. And I think what we've seen with smart apps is the value of interoperability, right? You can have um, third parties um, or even EHR clients create these apps um, but rather than each healthcare institution or each EHR uh, reinvent the wheel, um, you open up a platform uh, and you allow the creativity um, of, you know, of the people that come to events like this uh, to help improve healthcare as a whole. And I think the same kind of thing uh, would apply to, to decision support. And that's what CDS Hooks is all about, is being able to build 
portable algorithms for decision support and you know, have them be able to plug into multiple different EHRs, multiple different healthcare institutions, um, and ultimately you know, improve the ecosystem there and improve the offerings for decision support. Yeah. Um, and then the, this kind of question I see come up in a lot of talks like this, sure. uh, um, are there uh, production implementations of CDS hooks yet? And I guess maybe generally if you could speak towards vendor support. Sure. No, that's a great question. And yeah, you're right. It comes up all the time. Um, I don't think we're quite at a tipping point with CDS hooks, um, but there are EHRs um, that have production support. I mean, I know that T-System has has a CDS client in production. Um, Epic has one in production, um, and they're they're both you know working to fill out um, you know additional hooks and additional um, features of the specification. I know we at Cerner have an engineering team that's actively working on our CDS client, um, and based on conversations I've had. Um, we're really, you know, reaching the point very soon um, where you're going to see a lot more support on the EHR on the CDS client side for this um, to help match up with all of the industry's um, desires on the CDS service side. And I think we're really going to start seeing um, more of this in the wild. I don't know how much more time we have, but th there's one kind of question here that asks about some of the technical details around the jots and how okay. that exchange happens. If, if you were interested in learning more about that, do you have any, um, is that directly in the CDS hook spec or are there other places to look to kind of figure out how the whole uh, jot thing and signing and checking signature uh, process sure. works? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the idea of a JSON web token, um, if you're not familiar, is, is absolutely nothing proprietary. You know, it's nothing that, that CDS Hooks has defined. It's, there's interesting, uh, there's existing RFCs um, around this. The CDS Hooks specification does outline um, the format of that jot, um, as well as the, uh, the recommended algorithms that should be used to sign it. There are a whole host of different um, jot libraries for a variety of different languages. Um, to be able to interop with jots, whether it be creating them and signing them or you know, uh, validating signatures. And th so the CDS hook specification outlines the basic requirements around you know, the, the structure of the jot, what, what should be used to sign it, um, should give you the basic building blocks for doing that. And then um, on cdshooks.org, there's a best practices section that digs a bit more into best practices on the CDS client and service side um, around what should be done with that jot. And so, yeah, especially for, for CDS services, some of the things off the top of my head are um, you as a CDS service are gonna wanna have a whitelist for um, what JKU endpoints, basically we're about whitelisting public key endpoints for CDS clients, as well as whitelisting the CDS clients themselves that you support. So from a business perspective, this might be um, the, the CDS clients that you've integrated with or that have purchased your services, you'd wanna have a whitelist for that. Um, as well as if you're gonna call some URL for getting the, the public key, you wanna have a whitelist of what public key, you know, at what endpoint do you trust public keys? Uh, but there's other best practices that are outlined there as well. Great. Um, that's all of those questions. I guess I, I think I might have heard from the yeah. host. Yeah. I think we are out of time, uh, Brian and uh, Dennis, uh, because participants may have to move to the next uh, sure. session. So we'll end the uh, session now. Uh, thank you so much, Dennis. Interesting presentation. Thanks so much, Brian, for moderating the question and answer session. Thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us. Uh, talk to you soon in the next session. Bye, everyone. Right. Thanks, everybody.